Welcome to Professionals and Coffee, a volunteer collective that boasts the professional profile of public relations practitioners through virtual coffee chats. My name is Carolina Salinas, and I'm a communications professional, founder and project manager of Professionals and Coffee. Today, I'm so excited to have Adrian McCauley, founder and president of Delphi Polling and Consulting, and our first interviewer of Professionals and Coffee. She's Shivika Adwaryu an international student from Seneca College Public Relations Postgraduate Certificate Program. Welcome, uh, Adrian and Shivika, and I will let the microphone. It is your Shivika. Thank you, Carolina. So uh, Adrian McCauley is an opinion research and communication consultant from professional associations, advocacy groups, labor unions, government relation campaigns, and clients across the political spectrum. As a former legislative assistant in the Ontario Liberal government, Adrian helps clients effectively use data and insights to influence policy makers and the elected officials. His unique approach is to, uh, is to opinion research influenced by war gaming and scenario planning uh, that allow, allows clients to understand how opposing or competing groups could use public opinion to undermine their efforts. So, uh, Adrian, could you tell me a little about your journey, how and why you got interested in public relations, uh, in uh, government relations and opinion research? Sure. Um, before I begin, thank you very much for having me. It's, it's very nice to be here. It's good to, it's good to meet you. Um, I uh, grew up in a fairly political family um, where um, um, a politics was discussed at the dinner table. And I have an older sister who to this day is very active in politics. So I was always surrounded by uh, the debate and, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, political discussions. And uh, I always took interest in history um, and, uh, you know, military history and a variety of other a variety of other things that fueled the general uh, direction towards political science. Um, and uh, I actually, when I was going into university, I was really interested in international relations. And I was really interested in post-Soviet uh, post relations in you know, Russia and, and the Soviet Union and you know, things of the Eastern Bloc and Central Asia and things of that, uh, things of that matter. But I took, a, I took two courses that really changed um, uh, my interest in, in, in this branch of politics. So the first one was a, a political communications course at McMaster where I did my undergrad. Um, and uh, it was kind of like a PR in the sense of it was, it was a hybrid between the communications department and the poli sci department. So you learn things about press releases and speech writing and media communications and, and uh, campaigning. There was some political campaigning and a little bit of polling and market research. And then I also took a statistics course in fourth year university. And the professor I had was, was very good, who um, was able to basically contextualize and uh, explain how and why we use statistical methods for political purposes, uh, research methods, uh, both qualitative and quantitative. But um, I'm not very good at mathematics and I didn't really do uh, well in math in school, but uh, by taking this, type of math, statistics, applied statistics, I um, uh, understood why we use statistics and I saw a use, uh, a use for it. So um, I became very interested in campaigns and elections and uh, how public opinion can be used for a variety of different factors in politics, whether it's um, campaigning for candidates or whether you're an advocacy group trying to put forth a, a message. Uh, research is a huge component of that. So I realized I was much more interested in the science of political science, and um, uh, I was able to uh, find work in uh, the Ontario legislature working as, at first as an intern before I went to graduate school, and then coming out of grad school, I was able to work for that same MPP, Member of Provincial Parliament, uh, in, in the Ontario legislature, uh, and I was able to get uh, a much more uh, comprehensive understanding of 
policy and legislation and how, um, as the expression goes, how sausage is made and, you know, how what goes into uh, policy and what goes into legislation and how different groups can influence outcomes and kind of the politics behind the scene. And um, I left Queen's Park. I left the Ontario legislature in 2014, and I was able to uh, found and incorporate a company, Delphi Polling, which is what I uh, run now. And um, I'm able to kind of combine both worlds of of, of uh, polling and market research with communications, public relations, and uh, and um, the uh, the more qualitative side of of uh, this type of work. That's really interesting, and that's that's a so you almost studied all areas of political science, a little bit of PR, and also statistics. That's really really interesting. So. Um, can you tell me briefly uh, about what does your what does a day look like uh, in your role in uh, government relations um, and uh, opinion research? How does it work exactly? It's a very cliche answer, but uh, in reality, every day is different. I know many professions say you know every day is different, but in my case, it it really is true um, because I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, there are many different things that uh, I have to do that a lobbyist at a larger firm or a research analyst at a larger market research consultancy wouldn't really have to do. Um, but um, in my case, uh, I have to uh, do some prospecting and some business development. Um, so I'm out there looking for different clients. I'm looking at lobby registrars. I'm looking at the news, figuring out um, uh, how I'm able to uh, sell public opinion and, and different groups and how they can use it. Um, I'm also uh, pitching to clients and actually meeting with prospective clients, writing proposals and sending them to them and walking them through the process and learning about their issues, which I also uh, really appreciate about um, being in the business development side of things is you get to learn firsthand from clients about some of the issues they're, they're facing. So I learn about a variety of different policy realms and I get loads of information that I wouldn't have gathered normally, but having good discussions with clients, prospective clients, I'm able to learn a lot. So um, I get to learn as I go. Uh, but um, when I do have polling and, you know, I, I meet with a client and they want some polling done or, um, you know, the, some analysis needs to be done. Uh, sometimes my day is uh, designing the questionnaire and meeting with my panel provider and um, doing some survey design and also uh, overseeing the, the field work for that polling. And then uh, doing the analysis and the report writing when it comes back and thinking about, uh, you know, which demographics are more important than others or how the sample answers certain questions. And then more importantly, how my client can actually use and implement the insights from the analysis, because uh, obviously they're spending a lot of money. It's very important for them to be able to act on on the data. So that's one thing that I try and do um, is uh, not only to do the analysis, but to try and translate that data into something that the client can use. It's maybe it's industry jargon, but it's uh, actionable insights to really try and get the client to do um, to use the data. But sometimes, uh, you know, you're doing uh, policy analysis and you're doing legislative research. And sometimes you might get a request from a client who needs to um, familiarize themselves with a set of policies or ideas and different uh, jurisdictions where that policy has been implemented. So um, sometimes you're looking at um, uh, parliamentary proceedings and legislative business, and you're also looking at um, uh, where certain policies stand in relation to others internationally and in different jurisdictions. Um, and then um, sometimes there are basically there are certain weeks where I'm doing some type of work more than others. So for example, in a slower period where I don't have as many clients on the go, I'm much more active with business development, prospecting, meeting with clients. And then when you get the work, um, I don't have as much time for business development uh, because I have to work with the client that I got. So um, I'm dealing with uh, consulting with them, working on a questionnaire or doing some research for them. Maybe I'm working on a communications consulting problem or opportunity. So uh, there, are, there are a variety of things that I do in any given day. Uh, it's just sometimes some tasks are more uh, prominent or frequent than others. Oh, wow, that's really great. Uh, so you work on the both side from the analysis perspective. So you analyze the data as well as also um, do polling and, and create the data and then 
implemented or be used professionally. That's really great. Um, so your website mentioned your unique approach to opinion research is influenced by war gaming and scenario planning. Could you tell us a little more about that? So the idea behind my unique approach to opinion research um, is largely fueled by the general question, if the competition or opposition had the market research that, that my client collected, what would they do with it? What would your opponent see? What would the competition see uh, based on the questions that you asked and also the, the findings that you, that you had? And one thing I noticed uh, that, that fueled this style of thinking is that many organizations are subject matter experts and they know their material better than, than anyone, but uh, they can be very insular with the way they think, the, the, who they meet with, the types of conversations they have, uh, the type of media that they're exposed to. Um, sometimes it can be, you're more influenced by the people down the hall than you know, a competing or an opposing group. So um, I try to provide uh, context and insight into the research that my clients collect and try and basically say, okay, if I were your opponent and, and I had this data, here's what I could do to make your life very difficult. So an example of that would be um, one of the clients I work with is a coalition of, of labor unions. And uh, we run regular surveys, maybe three, four times a year. And one thing that I will try and do when I look at that, that data and look at that polling analysis is try and say, if I were a conservative government or basically just anyone who's against, in this case, labor unions, and I had this data, what could I do to make your life very difficult? What could I do to delay legislation? Or what could I do to uh, basically make, again, make life very difficult for you? On the flip side, when I meet with clients who are a little bit more conservative and a little bit more blue, um, I'll wear a red tie or an orange tie, and I'll try and say, okay, well, if I were a civil rights organization or if I were a, you know, a um, community advocacy group or I was just basically an ideological opponent, I would say, here's what I would do with this data to uh, undermine your support for your cause and increase support for our cause. And um, in many cases, it's a zero sum game. Um, so uh, my gain is your loss and vice versa. So the idea is you try and think about not only where you're strong, obviously in, in any, um, you know, uh, in any uh, organization, you're always trying to look at where your organization is strong and wh what things you do better than other people, but to also to bring light to clients on where they're weaker and where things can be basically, they can get hamstrung and, um, and how to basically avoid problems um, so they can communicate with a greater level of, of uh, efficacy and efficiency. Oh, that's very strategic and, uh, and really a uh, unique approach that, that does require a lot of work as well. Um, so what were some of the obstacles uh, and challenges you faced in your career? Um, as an entrepreneur, uh, I think the, the biggest thing, uh, the biggest obstacle I have had to overcome, am overcoming, and will have to overcome in future is rejection. Uh, quite simply, um, you send many, many, many proposals out there, and there are any, any number of reasons why they get accepted or they don't. But um, dealing with rejection is an important part of the entrepreneurial process, uh, even if you're a job hunter, you're dealing with a lot of rejection, you send out your resumes, you have a lot of good interviews, but you didn't get the job. Um, and uh, I think rejection is uh, very normal and very natural, and we all experience it in some way, shape or form. So that's something that I have to deal with. And as you get older, the more rejection you get, um, the, the better you are at dealing with it. Um, so you just kind of tuck and roll and, and, and deal with it. The, the other one, it's uh, specific to my industry of uh, market research and to a certain degree government relations are the um, high barriers for entry uh, in certainly in Canada uh, and a number of other jurisdictions but but I know this is the case in Canada there are set a number of market research consultancies some larger than others and some more famous than others and uh, uh, basically they're they're very established uh, the, the competition is very established and they have large referral networks they have just basically more throughput 
So they're able to um, generate more business from clients. You know, sometimes the clients will publish the research. That's a marketing, you know, that's a marketing activity uh, for, for the firm. They'll pay uh, advertising expenses or an organization, a poll, in my case, a polling firm might um, pay internally for some questions that are very interesting and then publish those. Uh, and basically, just by being larger and having more clients and more throughput, they're able to say more and do more. Whereas, because I don't have the same throughput as a larger, you know, market research consultancy or government relations lobbying firm, um, it's harder for me to uh, ride that momentum uh, because it's I I only have so much bandwidth and um, I have to uh, I have to deal with uh, just different market factors and different size. It's kind of this David Goliath thing that you have to consider. And uh, finally, um, I think um, my age has also something to do with that. Um, you know, when I first started, I was, I first incorporated at, I think, 23, 24, and I'm 32 now. So I've been doing this for some time. A lot of failure, a lot of rejection has fueled that growth. Um, but I'm also competing with, uh, a lot of consultants and people who are just much, much older than I am, and uh, they have way more experience under the belt. They know way more people than I do. And the only thing that I can do to really beat that is just time. Uh, and uh, and really, uh, uh, it's kind of like a trench warfare or attrition in the sense of if you can last longer, then your probability of success is that much greater. So luckily, through hook and by crook and some good luck and a little bit of good management. I've had some staying power that has been able to grant me a little bit of experience, a little bit of networking, a little bit of referrals, and it slowly builds on itself. But I'm competing with people who have um, much more uh, experience and also larger firms can produce more, they can meet more people, they can just cover way more ground than I can. So uh, I'm dealing with a number of obstacles, but um, uh, rejection, experience, and market factors are probably the three greatest um, obstacles that uh, that uh, I I currently deal with and will probably continue to deal with in future. That's very well said. Well, rejection is a huge part of everything um, for everyone, even even students. Um, everyone. Yes. Um, so, what advice would you give yourself when you were starting out your career? Um, you know, it's funny, hindsight is always 2020. You know, it's very easy to look back and say what I should have done and um, uh, what I could have done, should have done, would have done. But um, I tried to write these down and, and think about it. So um, I'll just kind of run them off. But one of them is to avoid complacency. And I think that um, through different phases of my career, sometimes I had clients, sometimes I didn't. So in between, I worked at my father's law office, just legal staffing work, things like that. And um, sometimes I became very complacent and I thought, okay, this is okay. I'm, my needs are being met and, um, you know, it's um, life is okay. And I don't really have to pursue this entrepreneurial thing very much, but then insecurity will brew. And um, uh, the trick is to really acknowledge your insecurity and then ride that wave and do something about it. And don't just, don't just sit there and feel sorry for yourself. The idea is to actually act. Um, so I guess, one of the takeaways there is that action will always be inaction. And that um, if you do nothing, nothing will inevitably happen. Um, so if you don't like the situation you're at, or maybe you're at a job and, and you want to move it, or do you don't have the job that you have, um, if you don't do anything about it, even if you've experienced rejection and difficulty, but you have to, um, you have to um, outlast that rejection, you have to basically outwork it. Um, and so action beats inaction. And if you don't do anything at all, nothing will happen. So um, it's important to think about what kinds of problems you want to solve, because we all solve problems in our day in public relations, you're solving a problem about, uh, you know, a corporate brand and how you communicate in government relations, you're solving a problem about how can this client get government funding in public opinion. The problem is how can I find a way for this political campaign to increase the share of its vote. Um, so you have to um, think about uh, what problems you want to solve and then uh, do what you can day in and day out to try and solve them. Um, and I think one thing to consider is that 
you are a sum of your actions. Uh, you are a, a, a total of what you did or didn't do. And sometimes it can be very daunting. I got five rejections in a row and, and you know, things aren't going my way. But if day in and day out, you look back and you're able to draw, you know, take a piece of paper and draw a line down the middle of it and think about all the good things that you've done, you know, the things that are proactive that get you closer to your objective. And then you think about the things that distance yourself from your objective or where you want to be. Over time, if that active side outweighs the inactive side, generally speaking, you're going in the right direction. So you have to uh, consider about how do you measure progress? Everyone measures it differently, uh, but you have to think about what can I do day in and day out that gets me closer to my goal? Is it um, booking a number of meetings? Is it sending out a number of proposals? Is it uh, writing content, trying to get yourself out there? Um, the, you, know, you have to uh, do something uh, about yourself. The, the other thing that, I, that, um, that was unique to me, perhaps unique to a number of other younger professionals or people who are just starting out is uh, do what you can to establish credibility. Uh, because with competence becomes confidence. So you have to do what you can to become very familiar with your subject matter. Uh, and in my case, write content about a certain topic that you find very interesting or try and solve a problem that hasn't been solved and do what you can to promote yourself and, and, and um, not only position yourself as credible, but also think about how am I different? Um, so I looked at the, um, the uh, market research community and I thought, how can I differentiate myself from, from the establishment, from the competitors? And I think uh, in my case, I found a niche, which is basically to act as like a sparring partner with, with my clients. And basically they punch me, I punch them back. We, we talk about the data. It's very factual, very data driven. Uh, but that was something that I found a lot of consultants weren't doing. Uh, they, uh, in many cases, they told their clients what they wanted to hear and then they moved on to the next client. But I thought that there was something unique that I could add to uh, a client's, um, uh, you know, um, a client's um, list of uh, values or attributes or things that that make them that make them unique. Um, and the the other thing I was considering is to be open minded um, to things that are kind of outside your role. Uh, and uh, for example, I really wanted to focus on public affairs and politics and political polling, but. Um, it's really only maybe 10% or less of the overall market research industry. So you have to be a little bit flexible uh, and uh, to be a little bit um, open to adapting to bending your skill set a little bit. So uh, that's, in my case, moving from, let's say, public affairs to consumer packaged goods or branding opportunities or corporate communications or whatever it might be that you can still use the same set of skills that you developed either in school or professionally or personally, and try and see where those skill sets can be applied elsewhere. Again, and, and that moves the ball forward and that adds to your experience list and your, your large CV and your resume. And I, I think that's what I, that's what I have right now. But the two kind of abstract takeaways there are that action beats inaction and that you are a sum of your actions of what you did or didn't do. And um, you have to do what you can a little bit every day to move that forward. And after a year, three months, six months, a year, 10 years, you look back and you think about what you've done and where you've come from. And you take stock about where you are in relation to your goals and what you want to accomplish. And, and um, uh, also to uh, appreciate what you do, to enjoy what you do. Um, it's important that if you're very busy and you've got lots going on, you really have to take a deep breath and say, I'm doing what I want to do, which, which even in my case of all the rejection and the good days and the bad days, I like solving these types of problems. And I take a deep breath and I realize I'm doing what I love to do and, uh, and to learn from the experience and to enjoy the process, uh, enjoy learning as you go. Okay, that's, that's very well said. Um, yeah, so it's always about moving forward and, and working through those rejections and um, doing more about the problem than being stuck in a problem. Um, and uh, so um, that's, that's really interesting. That's going to stay with me for really long. Can um, I add one thing? Sure. Is it okay sure. if I jump in and add one thing? Yeah, sure. Um, 
One thing that was advised to me when I was at the legislature and I wanted to go into polling and market research, I, I bumped into a professor of mine and I, I told him, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm very happy and very lucky with where I work, but it's not what I want to do. I want to move into this style of, of, um, uh, of politics or, you know, solve these types of problems. And he advised that I find a mentor and, you know, I find someone to take me under their, you know, their metaphorical wing. At the time, obviously, I, we all understand what that means, but at the time, I had trouble kind of coming to terms with what that actually meant. Um, but uh, I was fortunate enough to find a, about two or three mentors uh, that really, really, really helped me in my career. And one of them was polling specific, um, that he was really able to teach me about how to tell a story with data, what's important in a proposal, what you really need to do, and basically find people who uh, can really help you uh, transition into, into the workplace and uh, provide you with uh, real uh, you know, on-site experience uh, and maybe provide experience about some of their clients that they had in the past. But mentorship is very important. And I was very lucky and very fortunate that I found it. Um, so to, to anyone watching this, if you're able to find someone in your line of work, whether it's public relations or engineering or, you know, whatever it may be, um, find someone that you can learn from and who can uh, guide you in the process. And you don't have to emulate them. You don't have to be them when you grow up, but they should um, uh, get you thinking about these types of ideas and, and uh, some professionalism in what you do or what you don't do, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. I think mentorship is, uh, is, uh, is a huge component of, of growth. And, you know, I have my own sparring partner, my own red team, so to speak, to tell me about why an idea is bad or why an idea is good. And that strengthened me as a consultant. And um, ideally, that's what I try and do for clients is to challenge them and to get them thinking outside of the box. And they become stronger brands, campaigns, advocacy groups, things along those lines. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's yeah, absolutely correct. Um, and uh, so that is it from my end. Thank you so much, Adrian, for all the knowledge, advice, and everything you shared with us, with me. Um, and uh, and it was it was really great learning about the entire journey. Thank you. Thank you. My, my, my pleasure. Thanks for asking. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adrian. You you provided us with uh, so many pieces of advice, your knowledge. Um, now it got my, more my attention about uh, polling, and I, I enjoy it a lot, this conversation. And you, you did a, an excellent uh, interview, uh, Shivika, congratulations. Um, are there any social media handles that you, Adriana and Shivika, would like to share uh, with the audience? Where, can we, where we can find you? You, Adrian. Oh, yes. is it to me? Okay. Um, I don't. I don't uh, use Twitter very often. I don't tweet very often. I actually write a lot about how Twitter is is bad for a lot of reasons. But you can find me on Twitter at at DJ Sampling Error, and um, you can find me on LinkedIn, Adrian McCauley, and uh, you can uh, check out my website at uh, www.delphipolling.com. D E L P H I. Thank you, and you, Shivika. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, and I'm just on LinkedIn. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, everyone, and see you on the next Professionals and Coffee Chat. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and our social media uh, platforms, which are in the description below this video. And join us to do your own virtual coffee chat like Shivika's uh, did today. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>